Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of CCC Talks with Marco Laughlin and the Cloud Credential Council. Now, today we're joined by Gayatri Sirori, who is a Director of Engineering at Verviba Telecom and is leading product and strategic initiatives at Verviba. Now, as an executive team member uh, at Verviba Telecom, you've helped grow the company's revenue significantly since 2017. Always a good thing to be doing. Gaitri, thank you for joining us on CCC Talks. Tell us, Gaitri, tell us a little bit about what you do. First of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. I have uh, listened to some of the recent episodes and uh, your work in the space of digital transformation is coming with it. You're covering grounds from removing a headache from IoT and AI and blockchain. Wonderful yes. episodes, uh, yes, for sure. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, at Varviva, I'm a part of product and strategy team. My team owns our test and measurement solutions, our IoT products and enterprise software solutions. And uh, we at Varviva as a company, we provide network technology solutions to all our customers globally. Yes, good, good. So um, I guess when we look at IoT, we'll talk a little bit more about IoT and the communications because they, they go together. You can't have one without the other. But um, so in the telecom space, you know, uh, from what we see globally, telecoms is heavily involved in IoT, the Internet of mm -hmm. Things. So what type of solutions are you developing at Verviva? You know, first of all, what solutions are you developing? And then what are the problems or the opportunities they're trying to address? So as telecom, you rightly said, uh, telecom and IoT go hand in hand. I like to say that telecom is the backbone for IoT because yeah. unless you are able to connect uh, to that device, it's not really uh, a part of internet of things. So yeah, sure. our, uh, our, as a company, our focus has always been working on solutions that enable connectivity. So uh, our, we have always uh, worked on solutions that improve efficiency that enable connectivity so that the network deployment and maintenance and monitoring is uh, is optimized. Now coming to the IoT solution that we have, we have a product that monitors the physical health of the antenna. It could be as the much tilt or roll. So how the antenna is movement, moving. So antenna movements is something we monitor and run some predictive analysis on it. I think that's very interesting. And is it a case, I mean, for a company like yourselves, I would imagine that you have to heavily invest in something like IoT. It's not something that telecoms and networks have done in the past, say, past 20, 30, 40 years. It's only recent now in the last 10 years as device capability has gotten smaller mm -hmm. and um, networks have gotten better. Well, wireless networks have gotten better. So uh, is your industry having to invest significantly in your IoT capabilities and what you might be doing with that before you even go to market with uh, with any solution? I think there is investment and significant investment. Somehow with a lot of awareness uh, about IoT, people have simplified it to another level. Like yeah. you just buy something off Amazon and automate your garage door. And so it seems very easy, but there's a lot of research and development goes into building systems that are highly accurate and more reliable. So yes, yeah. there is a heavy investment up front. And um, I want to drill in a little bit more in a moment about um, how you might use these, but you mentioned something there, I want to stay on for a moment, awareness. Mm -hmm. um, are customers going to companies like Verviva and saying, we want to do something in IoT, help us, what solutions do you have? Or is that not the language? Um, are they, are they coming to you saying we've got you know challenges how can you help us like nobody ever looks for an iot solution in that type of language do they no not really actually you are coming up with products and ideas and uh, helping your customers with uh, hey this is what we believe can help you yeah yeah and um i guess tell me a little bit so bandwidth so iot is fairly recent in the it space itself a because uh, these sensors and these uh, devices are so small now as well. We, we've got technology that can make ones that, that, you know, from a size perspective. But the other thing that developed recently is the 4G, 5G network satellite communications. Um, 
So with bandwidth being so important, so I wanted to ask you about 5G. 5G is popping up around the world now. Is 5G a requirement for IoT or does typical IoT devices run over 4G or even 2G? Is, is that possible? Or old G, whatever we want to call it. Uh, so one thing I want to clarify is not every single IoT application uh, requires 5G. Like you rightly said, we've been using IoT for last few years now. Yes. And uh, it's been running smooth on LTE, sometimes even GSM. So uh, uh, I think 5G is going to enable more experiences, but yeah. it is very application specific. So the technology requirements, if your application is not very data intensive or it doesn't require low latency, ultra low latency, you can still work on 5G. But with that said, 5G is going to change this landscape like never before, be it in the form of these uh, high definition videos that you're transmitting or, you know, uh, applications, especially in healthcare and medicine. Yeah. I think 5G is going to enable the, uh, a lot more application in that space. Great. We've heard it here first. It's it's an industry scoop. 5G will revolutionize the IoT experience, I guess, which yeah. is great. And then, you know, as soon as you've done 5G, it'll be, 6G or whatever, and we'll be on to that. But um, so there's some interesting facts with IoT. You know, from a sensor perspective, yes, you can run it over almost a GSM network or an old, older network. They're still around, they still exist, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but then, as you said, we, if you're getting into video HD, uh, maybe security IoT, you don't just get the alarm, you get the video of what's happening with the alarm. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something of interest to a lot of organizations. But more interestingly, we have heard before IoT mentioned with um, health. Mm -hmm. and I think, as you said, it could be a game changer. We've come to, we're coming through COVID, uh, significant health challenges. There were, last year, we, we came across a few use cases of organizations springing up with um, IoT sensors uh, for people. Mm -hmm. Now, again, it's, you know, uh, an oxygen uh, meter that connects them to a health service. So they only go to people that were drops below a threshold, mm -hmm. which is fine. So if everyone else is fine, they're okay until they're in trouble. Yes. But what just hit me there was the next evolution of that might be also um, um, a monitoring system feeding back a video feed of that patient as well. So not only are you getting the, the biometrics, Mm -hmm. uh, the health status, but you're also getting a physical view, or just a true camera, but you're pushing that definition down. And maybe if they need assistance, that instead of them going to the doctor or the health provider, they get a call from, you know, the health provider, but all the systems are there, they can just plug them in and mm -hmm. you can check heart monitor, uh, you can monitor all the, the vital signs, just, mm -hmm. just like that. But I would imagine you need 5G for that type of um experience especially with the video but i think that's where we're going from a social perspective isn't it never mind a corporate view mm -hmm. of iot but from um a human factor is not a big play for iot as well it is and i want to uh, elaborate into the use case that, that you mentioned on healthcare a few few years ago i believe two or three years ago there was a demonstration about remote surgery and uh, how it can be enabled it was uh, it was about how it could be done with 5G. And I yes. think uh, that could be another game changer. Although uh, there, there, it will take time to build confidence uh, with masters with that kind of technology, but I believe that would be one thing that 5G can enable, but it is still a long way to go, I believe. It is, but I think that's, that's where we're probably going. So from, um, I guess, the human factor, that's a great way to go. From a corporate space, the world, you know, whatever you want, we can develop, which is really good. Um, I had seen some of that, and there is that confidence thing. While I'm a big, you know, promoter of IoT, would I want to be under the surgeon <laughs> somewhere else using all these sensors? I, I'm not sure, but sometimes, you know, that's what that, that's the way it's going to go. Now, as I said, um, most organizations don't pick up the phone and, you know, guys, we want some IoT solution, help us please, you know? Um, so I would imagine that, you know, organizations like for Viva and telecoms, you're helping customers, whether they're new or whether they're prospects or whatever. I think you're help. I, I just do help them understand how they might 
use IoT? Uh, do you invest time to understand their problems and then develop solutions or to say, hey, we've got things here that if we did this, would go there, you know, would, would achieve things. So are, are you finding that that's a big uh, a time commitment or investment that Viviva are putting in? Yes, because with IoT, it's not about just a product or a device that you're deploying. It's about the service. It's about what problem you're solving. Yeah. So uh, that is a big part of uh, our work here, that if you deploy this certain device, what is it going to enable? So you are always trying to do two things, right? Either you're trying to enable something new, add new value to the program, or yeah. you're bringing in some kind of cost or time efficiency. So of when we are presenting or pitching any kind of IoT solution, I think both or one of them has to make sense to the customer to buy into it, basically. So it's very important to, to understand what, it's not just the product, it's about what application it has and what are you trying to solve here. Yes, so a good approach for uh, you know uh, an organization thinking about IoT Mm -hmm. Based on what I'm hearing there, am I hearing correct that a good approach is if they go to an organization, if that organization starts talking about IoT and devices, they're probably gone to the wrong organization. That that IoT group should forget about the words IoT and all this stuff and talk about what's your problem, mm -hmm. how do we deal with it, let's listen to you, mm -hmm. and then let's see what we have that might fix things. So is that the way it is? or to get the customer to stop talking and looking for IoT, but looking to providers to say, help us, here's a problem. We can help you understand it. You help us how you can fix it with your solution. Is that the right approach to go? Always, like start with a problem statement. It's, it's always said, right? Start with the end in mind. So start yeah. with a problem statement that you're trying to solve because when you're trying to deploy IoT, it's not only the device, it's the data that you collect. It's all the intelligence that you bring to the table from all this data you're gathering from devices and also adding more intelligence with adding external data sets. Yeah. So I think it's, it is all about solving that problem, not just about the device. So I think, yeah, sage advice for our listeners if they're interested in IoT is probably maybe understand what IoT is in a general sense, but when you're going looking for, you know, help to see is it an option, probably don't start with IoT as a solution, start with the problem mm -hmm. and then see what the answers are. And some of them might be IoT, some of them might not, but generally, I think the way the market's going, there will always be something now that can, so we have Alexa in our houses now, we have all these smart assistants, smart plugs, and all sorts of things, I'm not convinced we all really need, but mm -hmm. we have them and we use them and deliver some value to people that get value out of those. So once we're now in that consumer sense, I think there's got to be solutions for customers and business. Absolutely. Um, as said before, I think the farming industry is, is an amazing test bed for all of this stuff, for everything it can do. Um, mm -hmm. On monitor, and we, we may we may look at that in a moment. But um, just in general terms, now without giving away trade secrets, because we're, we're not looking for that. But in general terms, how did you help grow the Verviva business with IoT and connectivity devices? Was it always having understanding the market and creating for that? Was it innovation and making mistakes? Was it just being right, or was it luck, or a combination? So you always want to always be right, but that doesn't happen, like we all know. So uh, we, Barriba Telecom was formed at the peak of LT deployments in 2010. Yeah. So I think to all our offerings, like I said before, are about enabling connectivity. The, our services range from, you know, build, operate, optimize, and monitoring in the networks. So two drivers, first one, uh, technology itself, because in last decade, as we've seen, there has been a tremendous change and change in how we as users use uh, wireless networks and yeah. a lot of change on the technology from the operator side. So that is a huge driver in e-deployments, 5G deployments. And second one is our approach. Uh, it's always been improving efficiency and we have some innovative ways to do that, I think. so. These are the two key drivers, I would say. That's been, that's that's fantastic, and I always like to think with innovation. With innovation, I'm going to use a terrible world where it must come failure. 
But then we, we caveat that with it's not failure if we learn from it. You yes. know, it's learning. So would I imagine that um, your journey and Vervibus has involved a lot of learning along the way. Would that be a good way of putting it? Absolutely, yes, that is true. <laughs> but I think that's good because you're not going to, IoT is interesting insofar as, like we said earlier, um, you know, you don't start with the technology, you start looking for a problem and then mm -hmm. figuring, so you're kind of working backwards to go forwards. And not every problem is going to be solved by something that we're talking about. Um, some will and some won't. And that's where the innovation is. And that's where I think if you find that the path we're going down isn't the right path, we stop mm -hmm. and do something else. That to me is called learning as well. And that's okay, I think, isn't it? That is correct, actually. And not every problem could be solved with the same approach. So you have to be innovative and be agile and see where you are going next. And, and if I follow that into the customer's mindset, because customers tend not to like to fail. I don't mean that in a bad sense. They sometimes don't like to innovate either because it can be expensive. Mm -hmm. Because they say we spent, I don't know, a million euros or dollars or whatever on this project and it didn't deliver. Mm -hmm. Well, that's probably better than buying a bad solution for 10 million that isn't going to deliver. You know, so do, do you find customers have an open mindset to innovating, even though it's risky to innovate and it's expensive? It can be. But if you do it cleverly, it doesn't have to be overly risky and it doesn't have to be over expensive. Are they open to that and, and that kind of mindset with you and exploring what might happen? So I think uh, I want to take that and answer it in two steps. First one is customers have been, see when you're innovating, you have to be extremely agile. You have to look at where you're going. And if you monitor that closely, you can yes. avoid expensive mistakes. There will be mistakes, but you can avoid the expensive ones. Yes. And, uh, second one is uh, most of the times this innovation and this cycle where you're learning, it's internal uh, for the organization. So yes. it's not necessarily visible to the customer before you launch any application or solution. Yes. There's hard work for a few years that goes behind it. So that might not be even visible to the customer. So at least in our case, it's all once the solution is completely refined and ready to go, that's where we launch it or present it to our yeah. customers. So it's all that is internal for us, the learning. Um, that's, good. that's good because it, from a solution provider perspective, it do risk that view to the market because you're not, the market doesn't see, your customers don't see all the innovation and everything you've had to do behind the scenes. But equally, you could, you could advise your customers that you'll do the same with them. So when they go to their customers, ultimately with a solution, it will be the one for the market, not mm -hmm. the 20 prototypes in, in and around. And as you said, manage cost and manage it well so that you control the cost, but you drive innovation. I think that that's a key thing. Mm -hmm. Now, within IoT, um, IoT is uh, disingenuous, but maybe IoT may be nothing without data. Okay. Oh. <laughs> So, okay, I'm okay at that one. So, I'll just use another term. What's your approach, I guess, to big data? Uh, you know, managing that whole big data thing, organizing it, trying to understand it, and then turning it into something sensible. Because what we know from IoT is it will sense everything you want it to. It will feed it into a database or data lakes or whatever. But that's all unstructured. That's just bits and pieces. So how do you go from that into managing, organizing, understanding, and figuring something sensible out from all of this data that's collected? So I'm really glad that you asked for this question because uh, one thing that we all tend to like is, and especially with the engineering mindset, we want, when we start with any prototype, we want this humongous yeah. data coming in, which is piling up and it's kind of exciting. But when you're working on applications uh, with such large number of devices, then one has to be very mindful about the data. So there, there's two ends of the spectrum. First one is you're, pre, you're getting only critical data, which is very important. Otherwise, yes. and the second end of uh, the spectrum is you're collecting data every second, every minute. So it is very important that some you find a golden zone based on your application and use case and collect the right amount of data. Because otherwise you're just collecting a lot of data and that, is, that may not add value necessarily. Yes. Yes. your application 
So I think that is something that one has to experiment and optimize. There's no right answer. You can start from either end, but there's uh, this golden zone that you have to come to and collect, collect that right amount of data. So yeah, there's an element of collecting it, making sense of it, learning, as you said, uh, getting something of value from it. Um, do organizations, I guess, understand um, that that's another part of IoT, the, the data part that, you know, they get these lovely sensors, they're doing something with it, but then there's either investment or there's a setup or the understanding of collating the data and then reporting that into this changes somebody's life somehow or somebody's business somehow. Do they understand that or do you have to, is that part of an education piece that you help customers with? All these other bits, be, I think, because I think IoT doesn't exist on its own. Mm -hmm. All these other technologies, big data being one of them, cloud and lots of other different things for it to, even networks, mm -hmm. to work. So I think from our side, I'll just give you an example how we uh, made sense of data. We started with, you know, basic analytics like uh, reporting, drill downs, and, you know, ad hoc reports. And yeah. then you add this analytical maturity into your system. Then you start doing more forecasting. Then you start doing predictive modeling, optimization. So I think that's how we traveled on this analytical maturity uh, cycle. That starting with basic reporting, drill downs. Yeah. And then when you add external data sets, uh, you, have, you can basically bring more value into it. Great. So that's how we uh, approached it. And um, to me, this brings whatever the customer is doing to their customers up the value chain because you know and i think for some customers it takes them a while to change their mindset as to with iot you know we may not necessarily be out anymore collecting the data and you know have humans looking and doing this stuff they're now having their role becomes well part of the role becomes analyzing the data and reports and drilling into that and then figuring out what does that mean where's the value how mm -hmm. are we do how does it make us differentiate how does it make our customers differentiate in the market or do something different or do something their competitors aren't and mm -hmm. it's not a value add for them it's not going up that value chain i guess in the organization that um iot helps them deliver a more valuable service so it becomes more important for sure. Yeah. And I think um, I think that's often missed in the conversation with IoT, that sometimes, again, it goes back to the technology, it goes back to the devices and the sensors and everything like that. And they're missing the biggest part of it, which is go look at the data, go get some, you know, the data scientists and go figure out how you get structure from unstructure mm -hmm. and find that value because you have the information. But it can be information overload for others. The analysis paralysis, mm -hmm. I guess, can kick in sometimes. Now, um, as I said, people get excited about IoT. Some people get too excited about the technology. Some people don't know what it can do. But there's something interesting in the name of Verviba. Uh -huh. um, so tell me, uh, Viva, I believe, means something. So how about uh, you remind me what, what it's what it means or stands for? So it's basically derived from a 17th century French word, word. So it's energy, vitality, or spirit of enthusiasm. And I think it perfectly describes us as a team and how we operate here. Spirit of enthusiasm. I think that's fantastic. And But I think that's a perfect name for doing something like IoT and connectivity solutions and, and everything like that. Because if you weren't enthused about it, you would not be finding solutions to problems that we don't know we have at the moment. So I think that's great. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to flip, as I said earlier on, IoT doesn't exist on its mm -hmm. own in isolation. You need IoT, you need networks, you need big data, mm -hmm. you need storage, you need cloud services these days because of the intensity of it. Um, mm -hmm. From your perspective, and again, and as much as you can tell without giving away the trade secrets, um, do you rely on, say, public cloud providers? A few of the common ones, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, maybe vendor like an IBM or something. Do you rely on them for backend services or not at all that you look after that yourself, maybe a more traditional way or in a private cloud perspective? 
uh, we do rely and we do use one of these uh, service providers. I think they have created excellent offerings in terms of device management or, or even some pieces for uh, analysis and they have very good uh, compute engines stored definitely. So we do leverage that. Uh, sometimes I feel doing the, especially the device management piece, which needs to be very robust, could be like reinventing the wheel if you want to do it from scratch again. So we do leverage uh, the existing infrastructure and technology available. And, and that's the pro and the con, the benefit and the disadvantage of using, say, a public cloud provider. You get what they provide. And sometimes mm -hmm. they change, sometimes they don't, but that's okay. But um, um, I think it, the important thing there is for likes of an IoT solution provider, you don't need to build that back end. That's a, that's a promise of cloud. And you're just leveraging what's already there and building your apps and your capability on top of that. So A, it cuts down your cost, your capex, all, all the good things about cloud. And it gives you solutions that you use that uh, mm -hmm. probably come in at better cost points than if you try to do it yourself. So like that, IoT doesn't exist on its own and in its own and of its own. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of, say, intermediary providers using these clouds, they're, they're, they're good out there. If I look at the um, services you provide then, so from a customer perspective, they're looking at service, they're looking at trying to generate value. You're providing a service trying to deliver value. How do customers measure a quality of service from, say, an IoT solution? Um, mm -hmm. What KPI? So what's the quality of service that they, because I think IoT requires, let's say, one thing it requires is their network connectivity. So there's a quality of service in the network. That's your that's a core bread and butter for you, but also there's a quality of service on what it does and how it does. So maybe mm -hmm. look at quality of service first, and then I'll drill into KPIs in a moment. So how should how 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 should that be measured, or is any any I guess considerations for that? Uh, so it is again with IoT, everything I believe is very use case specific. So for example, if you have a device which is going to be always on, which needs to be extremely reliable then reliability yeah. is something that you have to have. Then if you are working on some high accuracy devices, then you would want to have higher accuracy for the data that you're collecting or the higher uh, sensitivity of any sensors that you're using. So I think it is very much use case specific and reliability uh, life, in not only battery life, but the device life itself and what kind of accuracy you are bringing into the data. I believe those three uh, are some of the KPIs that we could look at. I guess the key thing there, reliability, that's that's actually quite interesting because I'm sure you've got reliability of the device itself, mm -hmm. uh, the reliability of the sensors in the device, perhaps, because if you have bad chips and they fail, mm -hmm. the device fails, um, reliability of connectivity, Mm -hmm. as well, whether, and now, as you said, e even even in you know a single country, you may have pockets of five G. Then mm -hmm. it goes into four G. Then mm -hmm. sometimes you're back into the DSM. <laughs> so you, even though you can say we can have five G availability, you probably don't want to offer that in places where there isn't five G. So the customer needs to understand this that there can be drop downs in connectivity. But will that or won't that affect the service? Maybe. You know, maybe I think it's important for the customer to understand that. That, like what we said earlier on, if you've got a sensor that can work on a GSM network, but you want to push a HD video through that, 5G will do it. But if that device is on, I don't know, um, farming equipment that travels into a 4G or 3G network, mm -hmm. we drop off the video. So you don't get quality. We can't guarantee that. So it's as important for you to make sure that you cover that in your contracts and explain that to the customer, isn't it? Yes, it's more of education uh, because, you know, like we were discussing about application, right? There's always the bright side of uh, everything that can happen and <laughs> some piece of, you know, what may not be possible. I think it's a part of educating uh, not only your customers, but also your users. That I think that's a big part, yeah, to... for customers to go and look for organizations that are willing to help and educate them. Mm -hmm. rather than just sell them equipment and devices and things. It's not a differentiator in an IoT provider that somebody willing to educate them as much as anything else. Good. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to ask um, 
serious question because it's on everybody's topic. Security, privacy. Uh, oh. we've, we've seen breaks, hacks, everything the last couple of years and, and beyond. Um, now, I'm not saying IoT is less secure. That's not necessarily the case. But um, what do you have any views when, you know, from a recommendation on what people should think about from securing IoT devices? Are there any one or two basic recommendations to, to protect themselves from security, significant security problems? So one thing is security doesn't come at the end when you are ready to deploy. I think security can, you have to think about it when you start building the product. Yes. Because most of the times when people think about security, they're talking about data in transit, but that is not enough. You have to secure your data at rest. You also have to make sure you have enough isolation in your hardware. Then uh, you're, you have to have secure boot if you're remotely booting your devices. So I think security should start with the design phase and not only in the later stages where you're just trying to encrypt your data. I think that's important. and. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, experts in this field who will guide uh, how to get started from the beginning in security. And I think seeking help is important when you're, uh, especially if you are, if you have sensitive data or you are building devices for some critical uh, applications. So I think seeking help sure. early on will help. Absolutely, so if you've got sensitive data or critical data. And mm -hmm. the other thing I always throw in, if you're a business, it may not be, let's say, sensitive data, but it's sensitive to you if your competitors mm -hmm. get it. Yes. Um, I think they need to consider that the devices are great, but uh, rather than be hacked in the old way, I mean, their data could be exploited through an IoT device quite simply if it's not secured correctly. And in fairness to companies like yourself, you know, an organization may say, look, we're not willing to pay what, we really need to do to secure this. Um, and they may cut corners themselves on there because you can only secure so much, but isn't there a reliance on the customer's end to do security themselves as well? So uh, especially for the applications that we have, there's not no end user interacting with the product. So security mostly falls under the person who's deploying that application in such cases. So right. in these cases, it's not because there's no user interaction as such. Yes. Okay. That's interesting. Again, it's. I think you've got to look at all aspects of security. I think you need to draw a map, the end point, the start point, and everything yeah. in is 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 exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I think um, I've seen again. I'm not saying you know in, in the industry some some consumer products have come out to market that uh, mm -hmm. to make them. Well, to make them more profitable, let's say less secure chips have been used over the years. So is that one to watch out for as well, the level and the type, and to work with a partner to make sure that the product is designed and spec to a security standard. Now, at the end of the day, if they want to make uh, changes to, say, your recommendation, it's not a risk back on the business then that they must accept themselves because they're the ones changing the security specification from the experts. True. Cool. Good, good. So it's one to watch out for. The other thing, though, uh, maybe quick one is privacy. So privacy of data. We've collected all this data. Um, there could be sensors on people or in houses or in whatever that is. So we, chances are some of these devices may collect, um, you know, that, that's the purpose of it, information on people. Um, but from a privacy perspective, does that get a bit tricky? In Europe, there's GDPR. But mm -hmm. in the States, there's a different rule, different regulation. When data crosses over the Atlantic, you know, we're now in this strange scenario where um, they're trying to fix it. But if they do fix it, it means data can't transfer over. Mm -hmm. Is privacy uh, maintaining that a challenge? Or um, again, are you, as part of your role, is educate? your customers on how to deal with privacy uh, challenges? So in this, uh, most of the times we don't deal with uh, consumer information, so privacy is not a concern. But for privacy, I think anyone who's designing uh, any application around that, getting the data that is required, not just because it's, don't, like it's not, it may not be wise to collect everything that's available. I think whatever yeah. you need, yeah. 
is uh, what one should collect so that there are lesser privacy concerns uh, that yeah. might help. I love that. Don't collect everything because you don't need it. <laughs> it creates a bigger security privacy headache for you. Just collect what you need and yes. then dial it up later on. Um, the big talk over the I know last 10 years, agile, everything's gone agile. Everybody's gone agile. Every business wants to be agile. Uh, and even in the project management space, so I'm sure you do a lot of product development. There's mm -hmm. probably project management in there, probably waterfall agile, you know. But are you seeing agile as being the main approach for modern product development as opposed to the old traditional waterfall method? Uh, for us, it has been, and in my humble opinion, I think uh, Agile is better for some of uh, the product development we do. Both yeah. Waterfall and Agile have uh, pros and cons, but with Agile, when right now, your requirements are always changing. There are yeah. new inputs you receive from the customers. Sometimes you're learning from data, and that is what is adding to the requirements. So being quick, being quick to implement those has always been helpful for us. So in my opinion, it's uh, agile uh, for our kind of products. Absolutely, yeah. But can I ask uh, very secretly, do you still use any waterfall um, project management type methods today in, in any projects or is it pretty much agile? It's pretty much agile. We are not uh, much into waterfall. I, I guess waterfall is going to be kept for building bridges, so. <laughs> <laughs> It's very really good because we need some solid and strong bridges. <laughs> you don't want them to change directions. Yeah, you don't want to change the requirements of building a bridge halfway through. <laughs> no, we want it over there now. But, you know, but I think that's important. It's an important point to make that. Um, you know, I think whether it's waterfall or agile, it depends what suits the environment. Yes. So you're in a very learning environment where you have to learn. You're getting input from customers. You're changing. You're mm -hmm. trying to problem solve. Mm -hmm. as well as develop. So Agile does suit that very well, I think, uh, which, which is good. Um, you know, can you recommend to organizations, say, starting out, one or two things they should consider how to get started? You know, mm -hmm. do they just knock on the door and say, hey, we want to buy some IoT, let's do it, or is there another better way to, to get started? I think, uh, first of all, start with the end in mind. You're building an application, not just a device. And yeah. uh, apart from, it's all about solving the problem because that's how you are going to convince your customers to uh, buy into your idea. Yeah. Another, uh, apart from key product recommendations like simplify user experience or build beautiful products, I have four points, especially for IoT. <laughs> the first one is uh, it's a constrained device and be aware of that early on. Sometimes you have limited space on the board. Sometimes you have size restrictions, battery restrictions. Although you want to increase battery life, you have weight restrictions, you can't have a heavy device. So I think be aware of those early on uh, is one, or oh, even with the cost, because you can add bigger and better sensors, but are you gonna meet the cost commitments that you have with your customer? Yes. It's, it's a constrained space, so be aware of it early on. Secondly, define the non-negotiables for your device. Uh, especially, everything cannot happen over the air. So there are a few things you have to have or in the device before you uh, ship it. So I think those non-negotiables that cannot be done with air, you define that and test those early on. Let's say your device uh, is not going to have any human interaction, then test the remote booting, test what is the behavior after that. So yes. those non-negotiables for sure. Third one is uh, be mindful about data. We briefly discussed that, that, what data you're collecting and how much data you're going to be collecting. Yes. I think it's optimizing that at some point. And the last is security, like we were discussing. It starts in the design phase. It just you just don't bring in security concerns after everything is designed and developed. So I think those would be my four pointers. I think that I, I think they're really good. I think it's really good to to focus people on on how to start. And again, sometimes as well, the very first and start with the, the the problem in mind, or even start with an open question as to what problem am, are we looking to solve and maybe have a conversation with that and find the use cases that companies like Proviba and others have done. You know, um, we're doing this now in this industry with these devices and this is what it's doing. So to educate themselves as well, I think is, is as important, but I think they're really good. I love the security starts from the day one, from the day you, you, you pick up the phone, you've got to be thinking about 
security. And then even though cloud storage is very cheap, let's say, for all the data you're going to have, um, it goes back to that security and privacy. It might be cheap to store, but it could be very expensive to, to, to address security and privacy for so much data. And then if it does leak, that's a bigger leak than mm -hmm. if it was a small amount of data that you know was just related to uh, non non uh, information not about people but just about things maybe you know um Gertrude, fantastic i have a final question mm -hmm. um we're going to ask you to look into the the crystal ball um, <laughs> and the question you know what is the future of communications with iot Wow, uh, I think that will take another hour. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's put it into bucket. Uh, first is uh, consumer IoT. And I think we are enabling an ultra connected society. It's changing how we care for our loved ones, our kids, our parents. Yes. Especially, um, I have personally used uh, with my family the remote monitoring for blood sugar or app based blood sugar monitoring for managing diabetes. So I think these small, these applications are really important and they, they're changing how we care for each other. Yes. Then we have all these variables and it's, it's very important to realize how much uh, IoT is enabling now and it, there's, a, there's this huge paradigm shift. So definitely as a society, it's uh, changing a lot. And I am personally, yeah, go ahead, you're saying something. Oh no, I was going to say, sorry. Um... Uh, I, I think that's a fantastic final answer to the question insofar as, you know, you focus on the human side, the humanity side of a technology, mm -hmm. uh, not the corporate side, not the business side, but just the humanity side, which you know, there'd be great, you know, uh, there's great uses in corporate and business and commercial and all that kind of stuff. But equally, there's the impact to society, which can only benefit uh, mm -hmm. from this type of technology. And I think that, that, um, that, that to me, that, that, that was a really, really insightful into your mind as to, to where this is going from the human factor. And of course, you and Verviva, I'm sure, will be there on that journey, whether it's a commercial solution or a sociological solution, you know, that human uh, solution at the end of the day. I'm all for the human solutions because they're, they're going to help me <laughs> at some point. So uh, I'll, I'll buy some of those in the future, I think. Absolutely. So, um, we're going to finish up. Um, mm -hmm. Listen, I thank you so much for um, coming on today, telling us a little bit what you do, what Raviva is doing, um, giving us some insights and some really good recommendations on uh, uh, everything IoT. So, it remains for me just to say, Guy Tree thank you so much for joining us on CCC Talks today. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. It was wonderful talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.